I would like to start with uh, maybe everybody to introduce uh, themselves a little bit about uh, your company, just that we get your, your answers into the perspective. Barbara, if you would like to start. Well, BNP Baribar Reem is the real estate asset manager of BNP Baribar Group. Uh, we are investing uh, all over Europe, uh, basically all Europe, all sectors. We're a sector and country specialist, topping that a little bit with some balanced uh, mandates and, and funds. Uh, while we are raising our capital uh, all over the world, um, we have a very, very uh, focused uh, approach on our, on our European round here. So Oxford Properties um, is Canada, is, is the global real estate platform for one of Canada's largest pension plans, OMERS. We have 50 billion Canadian dollars of assets uh, invested globally. I lead our Europe and Asia business, moving to London uh, 10 years ago this year. Um, so we've been focused largely on major European cities, and initially London, uh, most recently Paris, and most, most recently we bought a little building across the street called the Sony Center here, which has been a big part of um, establishing our presence in the next phase of our investment strategy in Europe, and happy to talk about that today. Thank you, Paul. Shuji. Um, my name is Shuji Tomikawa. I'm uh, uh, president of the uh, Mitsui Fudo-san's uh, institutional investment advisory company called Mitsui Fudo-san Investment Advisors. And uh, I uh, happen to be associated with the ULI Japan. That's why I'm here. Um, congratulations for uh, ULI Europe's successful conference. We uh, celebrated 20th year of ULI Japan last fall. And I, I believe this is the 22nd time that you have a European conference. Congratulations. Um, I would like to start with you, uh, Shuji. Um, the question is, where is the capital coming from these days into Europe? and how much is coming more. And uh, we had a discussion already a year ago about the so-called four whales uh, out of Japan. Can you elaborate on that and what are they going to do in Europe? Um, Jürgen san is talking about uh, Japanese uh, three public funds uh, which have not invested at all in real estate. Uh, one is GPIF, which has one and a half trillion dollar worth of asset, and they have not invested in real estate at all, and they're trying to allocate 5%, which is $75 billion. Um, second is postal pension, postal savings, which has $2 trillion worth of asset, and they have not been in real estate, and they're trying to allocate 3%, which is $60 billion. And the third is postal insurance, which has $800 billion in asset and not in real estate. And they're, they're trying to allocate 1%, which is $8 billion. And all these money are trying to, we, we call them whales because they are too big. And Japan happened to be too small a pond for them. So they will come, in, they will come to Europe, they will come to the United States. Uh, and they are finishing up their selection of uh, managers and they will start very soon over, overseas. So they will um, invest uh, indirectly and directly, uh, or starting indirectly, as I understand? Yes, they will start indirectly first. Yeah. Okay. So they will have so-called gatekeepers, Japanese trust banks, and beyond that trust banks, gatekeepers, there will be people like yourselves who will be managing their investments. Okay, so that's good news and bad news because uh, the bad news is they probably are looking for um, large big ticket sizes um, and it will, in your view, put pressure on, on, on prices here in Europe? Um, you know, it depends on you guys, uh, how you manage it. Um, I believe there will be a pressure on uh, yield uh, in Europe because of the size of the uh, capital that they're going to bring to Europe. Okay. Uh, Paul, um, you mentioned Sony Center, which uh, you bought um, last year. Uh, it was the second largest deal in Germany, to my knowledge. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. That was a question to you. <laughs> but um, more interestingly, and uh, I think that's, that, that has been a discussion for, for quite some weeks uh, in Germany. Why is it that uh, none of the German uh, investors 
were able to get the deal. Why is it that potentially, I say, international investors see Berlin, specifically Berlin, more positive than, than, than German investors? Or am I wrong? Oh, well, it's interesting. I think about the years in Canada, we used to talk about out-of-town buyers, guys who would come in and we would always ask that same sort of question. And I think you have to step back and think a little bit. So I agree with what we're talking about in terms of capital flows globally. And I think you set that context. Is our asset class is very much in demand on a global basis. And everyone's trying to figure out what strategy and their competitive advantage within those various markets. We like the macro drivers for 12 cities globally. And it's very much driven off that. And so those cities, uh, interestingly enough, probably don't include as many cities in Canada as we started with. And so we're in the process of, uh, of consolidating our ownership in some of those cities and frankly exiting some of those other cities. We've entered three East Coast US cities and about to enter a fourth on the West Coast. Um, two cities in, in Europe before Berlin and last week we opened an office in Singapore and are starting to think our way through, um, through what a strategy for Asia could look like. So, we, so, so there's the context. We also have access to capital, but it's not free. And so you're trying to define a strategy as to how do you generate that return. Our return happens to be 10%. It's a big number. It doesn't mean that every single deal is going to be 10%. Some of those deals are going to be core deals. Some of those deals are going to be development deals. Um, some of those deals are going to be things that we do all on our own. Some are things we're going to do with partners. Some are going to be things we use leverage on at different levels, and some are not. Okay? So, so why did we buy the Sony Center? We like Berlin a lot. We always have. We like Germany a lot. We like Berlin a lot. Um, we think it's a best in class, the best in class core asset in Berlin, if not in Germany, broadly speaking. Um, we paid up for it. There's no question about that. Uh, we believe that there's a rental growth story in Berlin that has already started, but that is going to continue for all the macro factors that I'm sure you've talked about over the last couple of days. We were able to put in place really good long-term financing at rates that you didn't used to lend to me back in the old days, and so that's, uh, that's a really good thing. And so for us, and we believe that there's an active management exercise that we can undertake. So, so for us, that's going to come in at the lower end of our return spectrum across that global portfolio. Now, if you look at a German open-ended fund or a German investor, they're going to have their own strategy. It may have a different debt level. It may have a different hold period, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's dangerous to get too kind of prescriptive about putting in a box what one group is going to do versus another group, but that's how we approached it. And you know, it's got a big, at a billion euros, it's got a big place in our European business um, you know, with a, with a long-term investment horizon. Is that helpful? That's helpful. Um, Barbara, I guess you were also looking at Sony Center, but maybe more broader speaking, where is your capital coming from these days and where do you uh, allocate it and mm. invest, actually? Mm. Well, we are broadly diversified. So our uh, capital base is uh, almost uh, one quarter each. Uh, one, one fourth about is still retail money. So the pendant to the German open-ended funds uh, in France mainly. Uh, about one third is uh, institutional commingled funds. Uh, one third is separate account business and about one third is club deals, the traditional one. Uh, so we invested the money of course differently because the variety, our, our challenge compared to Paul is of course, Paul can follow a very clear strict strategy. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas in our variety of different strategies, we have to differentiate. So of course, uh, the retail money has to be extremely uh, risk averse invested, uh, which means uh, pretty long term quality driven. So I think we could have competed with you on uh, Sony Center on that pocket. Uh, unless uh, you always have the hurdles in the funds that you are promising your investors a certain level of long-term return. 
basically the challenge is on the on the retail side and may I say on the same on the institutional coming out fund side that the expectation of investors is income. It's income driven. So that means that you have to generate a nice cash flow over the years and you have to try to keep volatility as low as possible. And that combination is a bit tricky if you need a too high leverage. Yeah, that's puts me on the way how to exercise a strategy if you put a too high leverage on these type of funds. So the, the trend we see in the very risk averse spectrum is almost no leverage. Uh, in retail we are on average below 15, 1,5%. And in the uh, institutional commingled uh, arena we are between 30 to 40% at the max, at the max. And the trend we see is going below 30% because that's triggered by one clear event, which we all know, I think, it's solvency two. Uh, that's, that's a big question mark. Then on the separate accounts and on the, com, uh, on the, on the club deal side, that's a totally different story. Mm, there we see a much, much higher appetite on value add. So value add uh, was the name of the game. We opened up last year. So we did, uh, for example, very nice new projects in Italy, in Milan. Uh, uh, for example, a conversion of a garage into retail space, which we started nicely. So these type of conversion projects, uh, that will be in very high demand in that, in that risk space. Uh, and of course, development, yeah. Uh, development is one other element where a lot of people hope to find more yield, but especially in Germany, I think we all share the experience together that um, it's almost impossible because the uh, market is so good that most of the developers who get a good financing from a decent bank, and usually they do, they prefer to develop it on their own balance sheet and then sell it as a forward purchase extremely dry. Well, before, to before, that, we, yeah? before you continue to pick on banks, I'm not a banker anymore. I just want <laughs> no, no, no. to. Um, <laughs> no, the time is over, but we will we will talk about that uh, uh, later on. Um, uh, I wanted to move to the topic that has been really the main topic in my sense today, which is technology. And um, I would like to ask you, how much is technology, in your view, affecting? not only your buildings that you own, but also your investment strategy. Um, and is it really, in your view, um, a risk or is it also an opportunity? And what do you do concretely with regard to technology? Maybe starting with, uh, with Shuji, because I, I think we, we, we're all a little bit familiar with Japan, but not so much. And, and the question is really, how is technology affecting Japan? Is it differently than in Europe, in your view, or in the US? Is it far behind or is it faster or how, how, is it, how does it work in Japan? Japan just started to accept we work. And uh, in, in, so that uh, we are probably far behind uh, Europe and the United States when it comes to uh, technology vis-a-vis -vis the real estate. Uh, but yet um, in terms of uh, uh, e-commerce, you know, we are building real estate that will fit to e-commerce environment. Logistics warehouse is very popular, which changed the business of warehousing business in Japan from a traditional warehouse to logistics centers. And also, um, we do have, uh, in my particular business, we are an institutional investment advisory company, but yet there is a retail investor relationship uh, some of the uh, investment uh, funds have, and there, there is introduction of crowdfunding. And that is a new technology that is affecting not my own business of institutional advisory, but the business that collects the retail uh, capital into real estate investments. And, and uh, Paul, how do you see uh, especially retail affecting? Um, I, I'm not sure if you are really invested in retail a lot, but uh, a general answer maybe on, on all, the, all asset classes and then specifically on retail. So I think the answer to your first question is it's a threat and an opportunity, for yeah. sure. Um, we had our European kickoff day here in Berlin two weeks ago. Our whole team was here, and one of the people we had come and speak to us was Omer's head of venture investments. And he's, you know, his genius looks like Patrick. And he is a very, very smart guy and a very, very provocative guy. And I know our team, some of who are here, 
came up to me afterwards and they were scared out of their shoes because you know, we are investing as a VC investor in all of these technological disruptors, which is great and we get one out of 20 right as a balance sheet investor in VC and they have 20x multiples um, on those investments. But the things that we're learning about our mainstream businesses is arguably even more important to us. So what trends have we, from, from those businesses, tried to adopt? So retail logistics is the, is the obvious one that's, uh, that's on, on everybody's mind at the moment. We have a big mall portfolio in Canada. I would say our, our best-in-class malls in those global cities that are incredibly well located, transportation hubs, et cetera, et cetera, they'll be fine. Um, but we're on our fourth department store chain failure in North America in the last couple of years. And so and that was always used to be viewed as an opportunity because these guys would pay you two bucks a foot and have no builds and all the constraints. There's only so many more ways to re-merchandise those half a million square foot boxes. Our second tier malls and second tier locations, tough business. So we were maybe lucky when I came to Europe that we were the new kid on the block and none of that stuff was for sale. And we were very focused on major cities and focused on office and so we didn't get into that space. Um, I think, you know, we won't get into a lot of that discussion, but I, I think it's probably been well chronicled kind of what's happening. Adoption of e-commerce in Europe is much further ahead than it is in North America necessities to mother of invention. And so I think that's why you're seeing some of those things happen. So we've made uh, a small investment in a little logistics company called Global Logistics Properties. And that's our first play on the, 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 the positive benefits, if you will, of the technological disruption of shopping center spaces that we're gonna play from a real estate perspective and hopefully find ourselves finding the right way to invest in that space, whether that is certainly in Asia where it's going to start, possibly here in Europe. So there's an example of where it's a threat and also an opportunity. And there's you know, countless other examples in other sectors, but um, that's the one that we're focused on at the moment. And, and Barbara, do you, um, do you invest also in things that are already affected in, uh, by technology? And are you actually investing yourself maybe directly into technology? Yes, of course. Uh, the, the, way, the way we look at uh, technology is that it will be the game changer for real estate in the future. And one of the reasons is that we are so far behind. Real estate as such is, I think, has not really materially changed the way we work. Uh, the last 30 years, and we're just on the edge of seeing uh, all the impacts of, of technology here. So it will come from the tenant side. One thing is that, of course, um, that the requirements uh, specified by tenants in today's buildings are quite very different than they used to be. And not only in terms of the pure uh, technology, uh, the, 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 the cables or the wireless, whatever you have in that, but also we believe that the old style business model where you had the nice 10 year leases, solid income, uh, that, that's, that's almost gone. So with the WeWorks, what we just heard in the panel before us, that will have a real massive impact on, on how we have to operate our properties and how we have to manage our properties. Um, at the end, we will be faced, that's what we believe, and we need to find good answers on that, and we're working on that, is that if you, are, you have the choice to either rent out to the WeWork, then you make your life easy, because then you have another 10-year lease, so you're just prolonging the old model. Hmm? Or you start thinking about, okay, how can I slice and dice, I think Tamara put it in a very nice way, on your own and live with shorter, more flexible space. But that, at the end, burdens you with too high costs for tenant fit-outs because our buildings are definitely not fit for these type of things. So one of the uh, new inventions we are when we invested in a, in a little startup uh, to do that uh, is in France, we are a very big residential developer, um, and we now found a, a model where the tenants can flexible build their separation walls within in a way that they, when the tenant moves out, they can easily rebuild that space uh, 
in a way that it's, it's tailor-made for the new tenant without that enormous burden of cost to tear down all the walls and to do everything again. So that, that, that these type of changes we, still, we will see much more on the properties as such. And then, of course, on the other side, um, we will have all these type of um, uh, issues to deal with. Um, how, how do we uh, indeed manage the, the fundraising or the capital raising in the future with all the crowdfunding coming in? Yeah? Because that, that's a big new, it's a completely new way of dealing with distribution. Yeah? And I could go on for a long time. So we, we have an own um, innovation team just focusing on that and trying to pick out the most interesting startups which we can imply in our business model. Well, I would like to ask a question, um, but maybe by hand because it's uh, 